Quite an interesting talk, the one before. Um, from my point of view, I would actually be interested in seeing how the, some of that broke down into various fields. It'd be interesting to see whether or not the, those who deal with credit card data have better um, application development than uh, those who don't. Uh, my name's Garrett Williams. I'm going to be talking about the PCI, DSS, and secure applications. Uh, I am a senior consultant for a company, but basically what I'm here today is talking about one of the bugbears that I have as a QSA and QSAs have in general, is that so we go into companies to actually discuss about credit card data and the protection of it, and people write software, and we've got to actually make sure they've written it securely. So one of the things I'm actually asking as a, to the community, really, is how can you demonstrate to QSAs whether you've got a secure application development environment and the competencies of your developers and your testers? So can your organisations actually demonstrate that to an auditor? How would you go about doing that? Um, what I'm going to be looking at is very specific. It's about applications, really about cardholder data. But quite a lot of the uh, practices that um, the PCI uh, industry are looking for actually do apply to a lot of other uh, development as well. So what I want to look at is uh, the PCI requirements. From the point of view of the, those who develop applications, you need to understand what the, the requirements are. So I'm going to quickly go through some of those. Uh, I'm also going to explain as to what is a QSA am I looking for, which actually is evidence that you are doing things. That's not just a policy document saying, oh yeah, we've got a secure development uh, environment. I want to see evidence that it is secure, because if I don't see it as an auditor, I will fail. And uh, I'm going to look through some of the things that I've found and make some practices, some notes about key practices I find that help organisations. So I'm really going to go through some of the things about software development, what I'm expecting to see in terms of secure development. Now, I'm not a programmer, although I can write Hello World in about 10 or 15 different languages. Um, quite often that is secure because there's no input. But... Uh, like most auditors, we're not experts on software development. So there's a double challenge here. Can you explain to someone who's not an expert in software development that you've done things correctly? That's, it's an interesting point problem for a lot of organisations when they're going for the PCI uh, Data Security Standard Certification. So, really what I'm looking at is protection of cardholder data. Um, that could be within web applications, it can be within applications such as point of sales. But it's not just the protection of the cardholder data, but it's also about the protection of the cardholder data environments. And one of the things where I have a lot of problems when I audit is people go, yes, well, we don't actually handle credit card data, we use a third-party website. And when you look at the security of their website that handles the redirect, it is totally useless. Any hacker could have got in and changed the redirect to the insecure payment processing.org that the Eastern Europeans are running and actually redirect people to a, a fake payment processor. So it's not just writing applications that handle the cardholder data correctly. It's also about writing applications that make sure any handover, anything that can affect the security of the card or the data environment is also done properly. And that falls in with scope of the PCI DSS. So it applies to all the system components in and connected, the actual people, the developers as well, the processes, the development life cycle environment, and the technologies uh, that store, process, or transmit cardholder data. And as an auditor, I don't set the scope, I just agree it. 
whether it's right or wrong. So again, I look at what web applications do and how they handle the data and the handoff, how they go from a shopping basket to a payment processor. <coughs> and quite a lot of things are going to be in scope in terms of payment processing, where the actual uh, secure programming needs to take place. So web hosting, payment processors, point of sale applications, um, payment call, call centers, the software they use there, software anywhere within the ecosphere of the payment card industry and the, e -mer and the merchants, etc., is going to be in scope. In fact, one thing that's probably not in scope is the actual client who has the credit card details in the first place. But there again, client-side applications can affect the security. So if they've been delivered from your website, they need to be considered. And in particular with the new requirements with the PCI DSS in version 3, one of which is that about third-party adverts being, de being de delivered to e-commerce websites. And there's already been talks today about the security of the, um, what is in, I um, can't remember the exact terminology, it's about the, uh, the same origin domain problem and bypassing that. And that is a problem. If you can actually infect an advert, and there's been cases of that, and that's been served on an e-commerce website, is there a possibility that can be used to actually capture the cardholder data? So it has to take into account the way that the websites and everything are written. So I want to see, as a QSA, that everything's been considered when it comes to you delivering secure applications that companies are using to actually for the, uh, for the e-commerce uh, and for normal merchants as well. And it's surprising that you can actually find hard order data. It's not just within the, uh, the payment processing bit. I've seen it in all sorts of applications as a unique identifier. And if it's a pan, it's there, it falls in scope, and you've got to show that it's actually been securely coded. So that actually the scope of the, uh, the PCI DSS is quite wide, often wider than people think. And when it comes to actually doing the audits, it's actually trying to make sure that those who developed that software have done it to the actual requirements of the uh, data security standard. The one thing I'm not going to worry too much about is something called the, pay, the Payment Applications Data Security Standard because that's tested and verified in labs by third parties before it's deployed. I'm more concerned about if you operate or your company operates a website that's using your software that you've developed, can you show that you've actually secured it? And <clears throat> You may be a service provider, you may be a, 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 a merchant, but there are various rules for applications, and quite a lot of applications do fall outside the PADSS scheme. And when they fall outside that, they fall into the scope of the PCI DSS audit of a merchant or service provider. So I'm not concentrating on the PADSS ones because they're handled by accreditation labs. I'm really concerned about the way that websites are set up to do the redirects. In fact, the SAQs have been rewritten in terms of the self-assessment questionnaires from merchants and service providers to specifically include the redirect scenario because that's where a lot of problems were occurring. <clears throat> now... Anyone not actually purchase anything online? But at the end of the day, you're relying on merchants actually writing secure code so that people can't steal your credit cards. So I'm hoping you've got confidence in the rest of the industry. And the trouble is I'm here talking about secure applications and most of you are already familiar with that. I uh, really need to get the message out to those who don't know anything about secure programming. But lots of the things I want to get across is that as developers, 
you're going to have to demonstrate that you are up to date with the current knowledge about vulnerabilities. So some of the things that Turbas was discussing earlier on, what the CISO knew, actually applies to what I'm looking for in, when I'm doing an audit. There doesn't appear to be many requirements about software in the PCI DSS, but um, there's five main ones. There's a number of sub-requirements. There's a lot of testing procedures. And it's the testing procedures that are not done properly. I have more confidence, actually, in software programmers being able to write code properly than I am in actually them providing the evidence that they have done so. So there are a number of requirements. And at the high level, this seemed to be quite easy. Any software developed for an e-commerce merchant or a merchant uh, needs to be devised, developed with best practices. So in terms of best practice, the OWASP guide is a very good industry standard. But it must incorporate information security throughout the software development lifecycle, which is why it piqued my curiosity on Tobas's slide that SDLC was so low. I was wondering if that was generic across all industries and whether it would be higher for those involved in writing software for the uh, payment processing industry. But in addition, in terms of the best practices, there's encryption, protecting of the data. I know cryptography was mentioned this morning about JavaScript and cryptographic libraries. But in terms of crypt encryption, they use uh, the, the PCI say strong encryption. How many of you as developers know what strong encryption is? One person put their hand up. <laughs> so if you're going to write an application, you're going to protect data, how strong encryption can you use? Now the PCI have defined strong encryption as being this. If you wrote an application last year, you're probably not meeting the current requirements because they changed the definition in January and didn't exactly tell everybody. So the requirements you've been tested against are actually changing as well. So the PCI require uh, strong encryption. They'll try and keep it up to date. They also want to see two-factor authentication and some other requirements. Passwords unreadable, proper user identification, authentication. The only way you're going to get this into your applications is through a secure development lifecycle where security is considered at the inception stage during the gathering of the requirements. There are a lot of requirements within the PCI about um, secure software and what it needs to do. It also includes a lot of logging of data and audit trails and protecting of audit trails. So again, all this information had to be captured at the requirement stage. This one is great. Follow change control processes. What's the standard ch pr uh, change control process for your organisations? If someone wants to change software, what do you do? Request for change, goes into the change process, a risk assessment, if it's accepted, it gets approved, then it's coded, tested, approved before release for development. Quite interestingly, because I also do a little bit of pen testing, which is part of the PCI DSS requirements, I quite often come across this situation with websites that we test them, there's a problem. They fix them, we test again, it's passed. One year later we go back, we test again, and it fails because the problems have come back. The reason for this when we actually start asking them is they change the production environment to pass the test, and didn't change the development system where the code was that they used to develop the next version. 
So with robust change control, that shouldn't happen. So again, one of the requirements we're looking for is the way that this is all done. Address a common vulnerabilities. Train developers. Pleased to see in Tobas's survey that uh, awareness and training of um, developers was actually quite high at the top. One of the things I, as an auditor for the PCI, I have to sort of ask the developers is, do you know about secure programming techniques? At least, how many of you are actually developers? Not as many as I hoped for an OWASP conference, but all of you should at least know what secure programming is about. But can you demonstrate to somebody that you do know secure programming? How can you do that? You've got to convince an auditor that you do know about it, not only that you knew about it four years ago, but that you also know about all the new threats and vulnerabilities that have been found in the last five minutes. Okay, the last month. And do you develop applications on secure coding, coding guidelines? So these are the things that um, the PCI are actually asking. And then they throw in for public facing web applications, they need to be tested, possibly put a web application firewall in front of it to protect it as well. And then write all your policies to cover all that as well. Your CISO will know about um, the policies, um, your development uh, teams, leaders, the R&D will know about the coding practices. So when I actually looked into this more detail, because I do a lot of audits, I found some key practices that organizations were doing. One, the ones that passed were the ones that had a secure development life cycle. They were building security in. So that was a key practice that I looked for. Um, I need to reword this one, but uh, I did it in a bit of hurry. Require developers to understand how cardholder data is handled in memory. I should actually say in the environment, including the memory. Because the one key thing these days, applications are attacked, systems are attacked. A lot of the big breaches in cardholder data in stores comes from the point of sales equipment. Car details are entered into the pin entry device. The till receives them, doesn't store them on a hard drive, it immediately encrypts them, but it does that in memory. So how can you handle cardholder data, sensitive data in memory to stop it being intercepted or being scraped? The knowledge of actually how the systems work and how you can prevent people bypassing a lot of the controls. Separation of development, testing and production. It's easy to say that you do this, but can you prove you got that segregation? And if you do have a problem with your production system, does your changes go then reflected back into the actual design and the development environment. And the need to remove test account credentials. It's the standard thing with a lot of applications, a lot of information security, changing the default username and passwords. A lot of organizations have standard test accounts which they use in testing processes. If they don't remove them and deploy them into the production environment, attackers will actually find those easy accounts and passwords and use them to get in. And the other one is about live data. You're doing your, develop, you're doing your testing in an environment. I quite often see development tested servers on the internet to enable them to be uh, tested through a, a public access. People forget that the test data they've used has been anonymized data from the actual live database. And I've seen the situations where people have actually used live 
credit card numbers, even though they've actually changed the username, the cardholder name, they didn't change the actual credit card number. And you only need the credit card holder number, the, the PAN number, and a credential such as the PIN or the CVV on the back to actually use that card. And they've been kept correct. For those who work in the credit card industry, there are credit card numbers that are invalid. All the payment brands have these sets of numbers that will never be used on a production card. They will never be accepted or authenticated as a proper payment card. And they're the ones that should be used for actually doing the testing. Change of control I mentioned, is it reviewed? Has it been authorised? More importantly, when an auditor comes in nine months afterwards and there is a change request, is there a manager's signature on it to actually say it was approved before it was actually put in place? It's the evidence behind the development. Are the software developers trained in secure coding? I think the question was actually asked earlier on today, at the very beginning of the session, about MSc courses in secure programming. And they said they didn't think there were any in the UK. So how are developers going to be trained? I do know some universities actually do do secure programming, the Royal Holloway do, and some other ones around the UK. Um, but how many developers actually do do it? I know some very large companies put their, people th their new developers through. Believe it or not, Microsoft do actually train their developers in secure coding. Siemens do. But for the rest of the companies, how do you train someone? And how do you then prove they have been trained? Testing of applications to ensure they do not suffer from known vulnerabilities. Well, that's straightforward. A lot of the talks I've heard today have all been about testing and the training or testers. I haven't been to all the sessions, I haven't been to all the rooms, but I've seen I've heard a lot of talks about testing the testers, or training the testers, with various models and such like. What about training the developers? That needs to be covered. And they also publicly facing web applications. Those who put the web application firewalls in front of their applications are the ones that will normally survive most of the attacks. So when I actually look at the requirements and the key practices, there are two things I actually look for. I actually look for process maturity. So as an auditor, I want to see the policies, the procedures, I want to see history that they've all been there, that in terms of a secure development life cycle, in the requirements there was security considered. In the testing, security was considered. In the coding, security was considered. So I group a lot of the work I do into process maturity and then the competencies of both developers and testers. And that's what I'm looking for when I'm actually doing an audit which involves secure applications is have they got the policies and processes in place? Do they have the people trained? And how can companies show me that they've done that? Yes, um, the PCI itself is actually quite poor. I know I'm a qualified security assessor, um, but I do admit, as somebody who works with the PCI DSS, it is not the best standard for secure web applications. It is not the best standard for securing sensitive data like payment cards. There are so many holes in it that an advanced attacker can get to the data. But it is a minimum standard that the payment card industry wants the companies to accept you as consumers will hope that all these people that develop the software are protecting your cardholders to the minimum stand, cardholder data to the minimum standard as well. So though they actually don't test for software other than just a few cases, um, it is important that they get it right. 
But part of the problem in actually the PCI and the secure software applications is the QSAs. QSAs don't not know, don't know necessarily know about software development. If you're working for a company that's been audited, you've got to bear in mind that the QSAs come from all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of different technical knowledge. There's a wide field that they've got to audit from physical controls through policies to networks to secure software. They're not going to be experts in everything. One way that makes it easier to pull the wool over their eyes. But the other thing is, a QSA should actually want to be convinced that you're doing things right. So how can you explain that you've protected against cross-site scripting to somebody who doesn't understand what cross-site scripting is? So I do appreciate for some of those people who undergo the PCI DSS that uh, it's not necessarily the fault of the developers, but quite often the difficulties with the QSA as well. Does the QSA actually understand what secure software is? Does he understand the vulnerabilities? And the only thing you can do is refer to best practice. And to be honest, I've actually known about OWASP, been involved in some of the little things, kept an eye on them for the last sort of 10, 15 years that I've been doing information security. I recognize OWASP is one of the best sources for information on securing software. I also know a lot of hackers who actually take the tools that OWASP does, develop, and use them as well as part of their arsenal to attack websites. It's a two-edged sword, but there are some of the best practices around to come from OWASP. There are lots of other organizations, um, SANS, uh, CERT, Secure Coding, the ISC Squared, who are here, they, have a, a co they actually have um, secure coding uh, certifications as well and best practice. So I expect to see best practices being put in place. So for the first key practice, I want to see formal mature design methodologies, specific policies and practices, and evidence that they're actually being used. Techie people have one big problem generally. They don't like writing. They don't like writing policies. They don't like filling out forms to say they've done something. But unfortunately, you've got to do this to show the evidence that you've actually done the job correctly. I also look for the competence. Have your developers done a course? Yes, we did the ISC squared one, we did the SANS one. Great. When did you do it? Four years ago. Have you kept up to date? What's the continuous professional development? Did you attend the OS AppSec EU 2014? Yes, good. That shows you're actually trying to keep up to date. The continuous professional development side, the evidence that you are maintaining your knowledge about vulnerabilities. The big one I find is about the segregation of development testing and production. Testers, well, developers are not the best people to test. I think that's generally uh, sort of a principle that everyone's aware of. Developers normally only test the cases they know that work or know that don't work. They don't test the cases they don't know about. So testing is specialised. So I want competence of tester, the testers. I want specific policies and procedures. I want to see physical and logical segregation of the environments and formal sign-off and evidence that managers have done so. And again, I want evidence that all the test credentials have been removed. And policies that prohibit live data. So I want to see where you got the, the data from. Make sure it's not from a live data set that you've not accidentally used live pans. Change control. I want to see evidence that change control has been used. It's been signed off. 
I also want to see for those cases where changes have to be done urgently, that they've not been forgotten about, but the change request has been done retrospectively. But sometimes changes do need to occur quickly. But that should also fall within this, uh, the actual design change process and should be caught up with. <coughs> Competence of developers, CPD methodology, so this is developers are trained and developing on secure good uh, coding guidelines. There is a lot of evidence that can be obtained around that. And also to ensure they do not suffer from known vulnerabilities. <coughs> so again, the segregation of testers, the methodology, and the testing tools themselves. And again, the evidence for actually public-facing web application needs to be gathered. So in terms of secure applications and a PCI-DS audit, it's not just a question of actually ticking that you've met the individual requirements. It's actually providing the documentation that you have actually met that requirement. So going from cons the conception of a... Of a software through to the final product, we have the secure development life cycle that's been talked about with security going in at each of the different phases. That can only occur if you've got the competencies of the, the, uh, the project managers, the developers, the, test, uh, the testers themselves as well. So you've got the, the, the core competencies that are required from the people who are doing the job. But you also need the capability maturity model approach. Are your policies, procedures, work instructions robust and are being followed? So when I talk about the secure development cycle, I also see it in terms of a secure, solid process that's managed, well-defined. So in terms of the capability maturity models, that's going to be a level three at a minimum, the defined stage. <clears throat> and I expect to see that, that the, uh, the people writing the applications are knowledgeable and keeping up to date. Competence can be demonstrated quite often. The one thing I was disappointed about is, and I'm not an expert on the 160 OWAS projects, is I'm not aware currently of an OWAS project to deal with the competencies of developers and testers. I did find one, but it was marked up as depreciated on the actual uh, website. So again, I was thrown out to the communities, if you're going to develop secure applications, you're going to need to demonstrate that to auditors and things such as an OWASP certification and continuous development would be a good way of doing so. There are other projects that are useful, the, the Open SAM that's been mentioned. There are lots of different maturity models that can be used, but there are open source ones that can be used as well. But a maturity model is required to make sure a secure development life cycle is followed every time. Developers guides available from OWASP, code review guides, secure code in practices, testing guides are all available. Even from OWASP there's actually a PCI guide to actually how to scope to make sure you cover everything that's required as well. But in terms of its standards, the OWASP, OWASP have done a really good job apart from one critical area in my point of view, which is actually the proving the competency of the developers and testers. So, coming to this at the end, I think I was supposed to finish about 50. About 10 yeah. Is, I'm actually looking to see that developers are trained and that you can demonstrate that they've been trained. Not only they've been trained, but they've kept up to date. Good practice is not often documented or uh, evidence generated. So I, as a QSA, as an auditor, would expect to see the documentation. 
If you go on a conference, etc., a training course, I want to see the evidence of continuous professional development if I'm going to sign off to say that developers are aware of good practice. Uh, I'm also aware, and I do push it with uh, the, the, the PCI as well, that QSAs must understand software development if they're going to audit it. So there is that situation with the other side of the coin. QSAs must understand about some of these problems in order to be able to verify what has been said. There are specialist QSAs for the PADSS, but they're not... There's not so much advice from the, uh, the payment card industry about how does an auditor make sure software developers for merchants are actually doing things correctly. So there are a number of issues that need to be done there. So I've outlined some of the problems. I've outlined there's some key practices that uh, auditors are looking for. There are solutions. There are lots of information available from really good sources. Uh, about developing secure applications. Where the problem comes is often the processes side, the documentation side, the evidence side, to be able to demonstrate at an annual audit that this has occurred across the whole year. But basically, as I said at the beginning, my question is for those who are working for organisations that are going to undergo an audit, can you demonstrate, or how would you demonstrate, that your developers are following good practice. Is there an easy way of doing it? This is what probably what makes the payment card industry audits very painful for both parties when it comes to looking at software. So, I'm gonna leave it there. Quite happy to take questions. Any questions? Yes, at the back. As I said with test data, um, the question was about uh, developers using appropriate test data so that they can actually make sure it works with um, all cases. Um, so they, may, they might effectively might need to use live data to make sure there's no problems. And there the requirement is that you don't use live data, but the payment card brands have a series of PAN numbers that will pass every verification test other than the fact you can't purchase anything with them because there's no money on them. But they do actually have test data that will actually meet all the, require, the requirements that you talked about in terms of being able to test thoroughly with valid PANs that will meet every single verification technique that will apply to PANs to make sure they're okay. It's just that they will never be used for actually making a payment. Does that answer your question? Um, in terms of the way that the PCI is written, the, that should not happen. Um, you could bring the live data into, the, uh, a, develop, into a special environment. Um, if you do that, you're supposed to change the pans so that they no longer are valid pans. Um, but it is a, a problem, and Providing there are sufficient controls to make sure there's no problems, what a compensating control could be used to get around the requirement, the fact that in one particular circumstance, a developer had to access a live data. Okay? 
I understand where you're coming from. It, it's not supposed to happen, but it, it will happen, yes. It's supposed to minimize the effect. Any other questions? Yes? Yeah, you were discussing about what you expect from the developers. Yes. What will convince me that a proper penetration test has been done as part of the testing? Um, they d haven't specified exactly what the penetration test is, but it is actually a full penetration test where someone tries to gain ownership or access to the systems. It is not a vulnerability scan, it is not a vulnerability assessment. They specify a penetration test by suitably qualified people who would be um, Crest, Tiger Scheme, uh, Check, CEH, because that's allowed. Um, the certified ethical hacker one. But there has to be evidence of what the, test, the tester did. So the QSA has to have access to the report and if necessary to the raw data that the pen tester has done. So it comes down to what the QSA's experience of what a pen test is. Okay, so you are right, they don't specify completely, but what they have done in version three is said that merchants must write a methodology that has to be followed. So that's, in the new version. that's in the new version. One more question, so who's got the heart? <laughs> the guy at the very back, sorry, hand up slightly longer. Yeah. You, you mentioned, with regards to development training, you mentioned a few things specifically aware of certain dedications and competences that exist. Yeah. What I've accepted is evidence that um, there is a policy for training, that there is uh, evidence that training has been carried out, and then I actually talk to the developers and ask them questions. Um, I, I'm not an expert in software development, but I do, unlike some QSAs, I do actually understand what some of the vulnerabilities are, and I can often tell from a, a question and answer session that uh, whether or not and um, they've actually underdone the, the training, etc. So, so like yeah. Some yes. Know yeah. I, uh, under the testing requirements, because there was a lot more testing requirements than sub requirements, the testing requirement is gather the evidence and then interview the developers. So there's the two, there is the verification there because I've worked for companies on the other side where I've been audited and I know how easy it is to generate paperwork in the one, in the one month before the annual audit. Um, we've all been there. Um, but when you start interviewing people as well, that's when those type of schemes fall, uh, uh, fail because people just tend to be a little bit too honest in front of an auditor. Yes. Yeah. There, yeah. No, there is no prescribed questions. Yes. Yes. And that's why I'm also speaking to the SSC about how good a how, how good the QSA training is about this as well. That's it. I think we've run out of time now. Thank you very much.